21st. Um, and we are going to start the morning uh, with H716, which is the uh, hunting and fishing licenses for uh, members of Abnaki tribes. And um, I know that Ellen did some redrafting. I think Emily has done some uh, background work, which we'll also look at or consider. And um, uh, Dan Dickerson has an updated fiscal note. The money hasn't changed, but the description of the bill has changed. So um, he wanted to update it. So we will look at that as well. So. Um, before we begin, let me see if anyone on the committee has anything they want to announce or ask about. Sam. Just, um, we didn't do, a, we didn't send the bill to the, the miscellaneous tax bill to the Senate. It's just not in the calendar for Friday. So is that just a calendar mistake? Don't know, I'll find out. Good question. Uh, I'm, I'll, 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 email, I'll, email, I'll email Bill, I just, I was you just like, you're gonna, no, I don't know anything about okay. what might have happened to it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Nice job though, yesterday. Was it just yesterday? It was great. Yeah, thank I you. Like, I like that you stood up. I thought that was good. Um, so, that's more uh, energy. In yeah, exactly. Um, anything else anybody's got questions about what's going on? No, okay. Um, Ellen, are we starting with you? Is that the best place to start? Um, I, um, so I've asked Emily if she'll report this bill. So I'm kind of looking to her for also some guidance as I work through this. Um, so I'll let Emily and Ellen tell me what order they want to go in. Um, I can do a little bit of um, context setting and then Ellen, you can tell us about the changes. Does that Perfect. work? That okay. sounds great. Yeah. Um, so I was in touch um, with the chair of BCNAA the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs yesterday, um, Carol McGranigan. And um, she clarified for us that um, every tribe issues licenses and issues licenses to folks under the age of 18 and that people can become official tribal members. And I'm sorry if a little, um, I feel very nervous about my language on this issue because it's not something I'm entirely familiar with but um, that licenses can be issued at any point um, and membership can be issued at any point and each tribe does it slightly differently, but they all have the ability and do it for folks who are minors. And so in order to have the most clarity on this, we felt like just removing the section on minors made the most sense and she was in agreement on that um, and offered to pull all of the chiefs together over, you know, after this, after this passes, um, she's happy to pull all the chiefs together to have a conversation to make sure that there's a consistent procedure for that licensing, just to make sure that, you know, how this is administered, how this is administered is consistent, um, but doesn't see any need to hold up the bill while they figure that out, that um, things will be fine while it gets figured out and would like us to move forward. Okay, let me see if there's questions. I don't see any. Um... Good, so, so uh, Ellen, so why don't you go through the redraft? Um. Sure, so uh, draft 2.1 is posted on your website. <coughs> the, the only change, um, so there, there are two changes as Representative Kornheiser just mentioned, I struck in section one, uh, 7B. Which, did, which was the section that referenced minors needing um, some form of parental consent or, or written um, notification from the parent. So I struck that, that section entirely. And I also added the cross-reference to chapter 23 of Title I um, so that we could be specific that we're talking about tribes that have been recognized by the state of Vermont. So the new language now reads, a certified citizen of a Native American Indian tribe that has been recognized by the state pursuant to one VSA chapter 23 may receive a free permanent fishing license or if the person qualifies for a hunting license, a free permanent combination hunting and fishing license upon submission of a current and valid tribal identification card. 
So I did uh, confer with Damian Leonard in our office yesterday, who is the, the attorney that normally works in chapter 23. So we just reframed the language slightly and I think it is a little more clear. I think it's much better. Um, and um, so appreciate that work that went into that. Um, I don't see questions. Is that, the, um, have, I guess the other two changes are the two dates. Is that right, that we've already reviewed? Yep. Um, so there aren't any changes from yesterday's draft. We did change yesterday the, the date of the report, pushing it out to 2024 yeah. and the effective date. Yep. Right. Uh, uh, let me give um, Paul uh, uh, and Lewis, who are our two guests today on this, um, a chance to comment if they want. Um, Paul, do you have any comments or questions for us? I like the changes to the better bill. Great, good. How about you, Lewis? I know. Thank you very much for, for making the changes and, and heeding the suggestions, and, and I appreciate it. And uh, I also appreciate Chief Stevens' uh, email and, and suggestions uh, to you. So thank you. Great. Uh, so uh, I don't know if there's anyone. I, I want to be sure that if there's someone else in the room who is interested, they get a chance to comment. Uh, George and Emily. Um, I just wondered if we could go over to fiscal note with Dan. Yeah, we will. Yeah. Uh, Emily, did you have a question first or you want to move to Dan? Um, yeah, I would, right before Dan, I would just love um, if we could find some way um, semi-officially of empowering the commission to pull together those tribes to figure this out. And that might be, I don't know if it's a letter from us or a letter from you, Lewis, or asking um, another committee perhaps House Natural Resources to write a letter from, but um, so that she has a little bit of standing to bring those people together. I don't think it's necessary for it even to be in session law, but it might be a nice um, sort of semi-official step to make. Um, I'm, I don't know who's most appropriate. It feels sort of strange for our committee to do it, you know, to um, tell the, for tribes to come up with something that's uniform just sort of feels like really, really not our world. Um, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, Paul, do you have any thoughts about it or Lewis or Jim? Can't, uh, can't hear you, Paul. I think you're talking. Yeah, you are. <laughs> uh, I agree with you, Madam Chair. I think we uh, should allow the tribes to go forward uh, and without uh, trying to tell them what they should do as far as unifying. I, I think they are at a difficult time as it was as to who could speak for one another and they were very guarded of their own identity. And so uh, I would hate to in, uh, infringe upon that. Yeah, uh, Lewis. Yeah, I was just gonna suggest maybe a letter uh, thanking the chair of the commission and taking her up on her offer from the three committees, uh, general, natural, and ways and means. Um, I, I don't know uh, how that could be received amiss um, to, to, to uh, accept her offer uh, that she made, uh, but but uh, that, that's really for you guys to uh, thank you. Yeah, I have not had conversations um, with general committee. I've talked with uh, Amy Sheldon and I've exchanged some emails, but I haven't um, hadn't had any conversations with one students about it. So, um, you know, maybe something that we can figure out, um, but it probably isn't something we can figure out right now. Jim? Yeah, um, I think a letter would be a good idea if it's yeah. by three tribes or just one or who knows what. Um, the phone's ringing, so don't. That's you, okay. <laughs> um, they went to answer me. Um, I would request that how the how the uh, I would I would note that how it's worded maybe turns out to be important, and I would hope that it wasn't be to have the BCNNA um, limit their conversation with the four recognized tribes because there are other tribes that um, wish to. Um, apply for recognition. I know some of them, but I know that there are others that I don't know just who they are. And I wouldn't want the letter to be used 
as a way of excluding those who are on the on the outside but wish to come into the into the circle. Um, and there may be an easy way to do that that just doesn't circumscribe who can come in to this conversation only. It can be a an interesting conversation. I know, for example, the tribe that I'm a member of, um, we have a way of of recognizing members and issuing cards. And I would suspect that our chief would want to be a quiet, um, not altogether quiet, a, uh, a part of the conversation, but not to the exclusive. Oh, sorry. Let me anyway, so not the exclusive of uh, exclusion yeah. of anybody else. That's all. So my, my uh, sense of this is that um, uh, People are going to want to take advantage of this. This is this is a, a thing of, of value, um, and that um, all the tribes, in their own way, are going to want to make it uh, accommodate or make it possible for their members um, to uh, demonstrate what they need to demonstrate to the department in order to get these licenses. So I'm 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 not sure that we really need to tell them to do that. I think they're going to want to do it. Yep, Jim. Um, I just point out that the process of becoming a recognized tribe is not an easy one. Oh, I know. Yeah. Um, and so um, recognizing that, that that is not going to change, I'm just talking about the conversation between. I'm, I'm saying something different. I, what okay. I'm saying is that I'm not yeah, sure okay. that I feel like we need to write a letter because I think they're going to try to do it anyway. Um, oh, that may be true. I think we can tie ourselves up in knots um, trying to write the perfect letter. And that's we going may to create more problems than we solve, but um, but that's that doesn't doesn't mean that um, it won't happen. It just means that I'm at this moment. I I don't feel like I can commit to trying to make it happen or to make it happen. Um, I think that's fine. I understand that that Carol may want to get chiefs together anyway, and that's fine. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I would think they want to. Um, other thoughts. Lewis or has questions? a question. Uh, Dan. Dickerson, I know you're here. Hello. Hi. Can Come you see on. me and hear me? Yeah. Um, so as you um, previously mentioned, um, the only change that I made to the fiscal note is in is under the bill summary. And I just removed, um, you know, the, the little blurb that I'd made that mentions the, the sort of separate process for minors uh, because that's no longer in the bill. Um, I don't think it changes the money because uh, minors would still be able to receive the lifetime license um, or, well, I guess they wouldn't, maybe they would get an annual fishing license. Um, I don't think they would be able to hunt until they're a certain age, but um, I don't think it changes the money. So I, I didn't, anything under the fiscal summary um, wasn't changed. It was, it was just the little piece in the bill summary that I um, altered. Great. So Thank that's you. it. Yep. Uh, any questions? Anyone has? So we're still talking about 30 to 35,000, which is not insignificant given the fiscal situation for the department. Um, and I, I, I want to say that although I'm not in favor of addressing those issues in this bill, I agree that we need to deal with them. And um, to the extent our committee is involved in that discussion, um, I just want to I want to assure those who, um, who are worried about it, but particularly the commissioner, that um, this is something that we recognize is a, is a real issue. And we understand this bill has not made it easier. Um, so, George. I was just going to note that uh, the 30 to 35,000 estimate is just for the annual five year licenses, but there's another five to 10,000 right, uh, year, yearly for the uh, right. lifetime licenses. So, yeah, yeah 35 to 45,000. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, anything else anyone has? Would a motion be appropriate, Madam Chair? I think it would be. I'd, I'd like to move that we report the bill out favorably. Uh, first of all, I think we need to amend it. I'm sorry, yes. So um, uh, uh, Peter is moving to amend the bill um, as 
set forth in draft number Ellen, what is it? Do we? 2.1. 2.1. 2.1. Thank you. Um, draft 2.1. Is there a second to that? Second. Okay. Uh, it's been moved and seconded that we um, adopt draft 2.1 as an, as an amendment. Um, and if people are ready to vote, I'll have Robin call the roll. And where she is. Uh, there she is. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> people um, all set. Okay. Great. Representative Anthony? Yes. Representative Beck? Yes. Representative Brennan? No. Representative Donovan? Yes. Representative Kornheiser? Yes. Representative Maslin? Yes. Representative Shy is yes. Representative Till? Yes. Representative Young? Yes. Representative Canfield? Yes. Representative Ansel? Yes. 10-1-0 on the amendment. Good, and now I need a uh, motion to move the bill as amended. Sure, why not? Jim. Second. Okay, so moved and seconded to move the bill as amended. Um, which is. Is that Jim and Peter again? Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So if there people are ready to vote, we'll go ahead and call the roll. Okay. Representative Anthony. Yes. Representative Beck. Yes. Representative Brennan. No. Representative Donovan. Yes. <coughs> Representative Kornheiser. Yes. Representative Maslin. Yep. Representative Shy is yes. Representative Till. Yes. Representative Young. Yes. Representative Canfield. Yes. Representative Ansel. Yes. 10 1 0. Good. Very good. Thank you, right. committee. Um, and thank you to all the people who are uh, here to help and uh, Paul, particularly you and Lewis. Um, so uh, in, in Thanks very much. Debate on the floor and Emily, you're gonna uh, report it. So, um, you know, those of us on the committee who uh, will all be there to support you. Um, so, um, so I am going to shift gears now um, to the uh, just a, a review. Uh, I don't know, Sorsha, can you remind me what I had next on the schedule? Is it school construction or did I move to liquor? It is school construction. Okay, thank you. I don't have the schedule up in front and of me. Rebecca Wasserman is here. Okay, so what I wanted to do was just go over the school construction draft that we were working on when we left the building in March. Um, I don't have any particular action in mind at the moment, but it's a bill that we spent quite a lot of time working on. And I think it is continues to be a priority for the education committee. So I didn't want it to just uh, fall by the wayside. Um, uh, and that said, I also want to mention um, rent or rebate a bill that we spent a ton of time on um, early in the session. It's gotten sort of lost in the shuffle. Um, I did talk with the speaker uh, a couple days ago and said, you know, we would like it on our priority list of bills that we'd like the Senate to spend some uh, time on and turn their attention to. Um, I think I had a, a email exchange with tax um, that they're good with it as long as they, we postpone the effective date. They're not sure they can stand up the program given the time constraints and what's going on in their world and in ours. And I said, I thought that would probably be fine. Um, better to enact it with a later effective date than to start from scratch next year. So um, I hope that's agreeable with everybody. Um, but I also just wanted to mention it because I don't know about the rest of you, but in all that's been going on, I had sort of forgotten about it and wanted to put it back on the front burner again. Um, so um, with that, um, Becky, you're going to walk us through this. And after, when we're done with this, we're not going to take action on this, but when we're done with this, we're going to uh, look at the liquor bill that we got a day or two ago. Okay. Hi, good morning. Um, I am going to uh, walk through the um, 
House Education's amendment to H209. So that was a strike all amendment to a bill relating to um, state aid for school construction. So Becky, before you do that, didn't we do have a redraft that we had put on the table? Um, thought, or did we not? I think there was discussion starting okay. about it, but I, I don't believe the committee ever saw a redraft. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, so in in this version from the house, um, there. So as a reminder, there's a, a moratorium on the, the state aid program for school construction that dates back to 2007. So this um, bill is trying to address how to deal with um, uh, a lot of the the school construction that's. Um, that needs to be done. There's a, there's a big uh, sort of capacity going forward, and um, so it's it's addressing this in a few different steps. So the first step is in section one, um, which is asking the secretary of education to work with um, Vermont Superintendents Association, the State Board of Education, and the Commissioner of Buildings and General Services to update the school facility standards. And that would be due by January 15th of next year. And that update, um, it says, uh, shall reflect modern educational requirements and opportunities. And then um, together with that, the State Board of Education by January 15th of next year is tasked with updating and adopting a capital outlay financing formula. Um, this formula was part of figuring out um, the, the costs for what, what the state would pay for certain costs for school construction under the old program. And this is a, a state board rule that's in place right now, but has not been updated in a number of years. So it, it looks at establishing maximum and minimum square footage parameters by school size, um, grade range through a square footage allowance per student or program, um, and also establishes an allowable cost per square foot of construction. And so I think the idea with the step one is figuring out what are the, the standard sort of facility standards around the state. And then the next step is step two in section two, um, which calls for um, the Secretary of Education to work with BGS to do um, an RFP for a school facilities condition analysis. Um, so that would be looking at um, statewide school facilities needs and costs. And this would be due uh, February 15th, 2021. The RFP uh, should be issued by then. And so it can be informed by the standards that are due a month earlier. Um, and the analysis would include both a uh, review of school facilities conditions and space needs. In subsection B, the Secretary of Education um, would contract with an independent third party to conduct this analysis. And that analysis um, shall be completed on or before June 15th, 2023. Um, so that's, um, that gives the third party some time to, to complete that analysis. And in subsection C, there is 1.5 million appropriated from the Ed Fund um, to conduct this analysis. And in subsection D, there is a definition of school. So this, um, this is trying to figure out who would be captured in this conditions analysis. And the definition that was chosen um, was to, to stick with the definition that's used right now um, for the school construction aid program. Um, so what what they had been who who had been receiving aid under that program, and then finally section three um, is looking at funding of school construction. So um, by December fifteenth, twenty twenty three, the Secretary of Education would work with the state treasurer and the bond bank to submit a report. Um, if you can scroll down for a shot to uh, corrections and institutions and education and the Senate side um, institutions and in education um, with the following information. Uh, so there would be an analysis of the challenges and opportunities to the state, if any, of funding school construction program projects 
uh, recommendations for funding source, if any, um, and that should be linked to inventory needs and conditions of all Vermont schools. And then um, it would also look at how other states are funding school construction projects. Um, again, on line 10, there's a definition of school in here that um, mean, has the same meaning as is in statute for the state aid for school construction program right now. The effective date in section four is July 1st, 2020. Uh, Peter and George. I'm just going back when I read this this morning, trying to recall whether there was a consensus to sort of hit the pause button um, in light of uh, the, the um, potential exposure of the Ed Fund. And I'm reading the bill and I, I can't tell whether the moratorium is uh, repealed. It seems to say so. And I thought the sense of the committee was to hit pause until in fact the inventory was done and some clarity about prioritization happened. Um, indeed, schools can go on their own, but there wouldn't be state participation unless and until we, we uh, had done that kind of study, inventory and prioritization, but perhaps I'm re misremembering. So this language does not repeal the moratorium. Um, that is still in place. Um, I think the the idea of section three is to come up with if if the state decides to do some sort of funding scheme to come up with ways that it can be done, but it is not suggesting that the program continue. Um, this program has not um, been operational since two thousand seven, um, and even I think if the agency wanted to continue right now and the, the legislature wanted to just start it up again, I think that would be difficult administratively because I don't know that they would have the, the resources to do that. George and Robin. Um, so I think that we should change um, the title of this um, instead of just the school facilities condition analysis, it should be um, and construction needs related to COVID-19 and get the, uh, <clears throat> the money to come out of the CARES fund of 1.5 million rather than out of the Ed fund. Because there may be some things we really need to change related to the virus when schools restart. Yeah, I mean, that's it, it, uh, listening to Becky, I realized that this draft was written a couple centuries ago in, in terms of, <laughs> of, the, of the way things are feeling. Um, we had had quite a lot of discussion about sort of a different approach here, which is not reflected in the draft. And I thought there was a draft that reflected some of that. Um, if there was, um, it's this isn't it. Um, so, um, and I know Scott, you and I had talked a bit as well. So, um, but even that, so that work isn't reflected here, um, but the new world that we're in with all the uh, challenges and resources is also not reflected here. So my goal here was just to say, this is, this is, what, this is what we have in front of us. Um, and is there um, work that we can do in the time that we have that moves this issue along. Um, and George, you're absolutely right. It, it, you know, if we can figure out a way of using CRF money, we should do that. Um, Cause a million and a half right now in the ad fund would be a big deal. Uh, Robin. Thanks. So first, I totally agree with George's um, idea. And um, so I think that's great. And secondly, I, I, uh, Representative Anthony's comment reminded me that I know, I thought we also had talked about figuring out some way of prioritizing. Um, and I, and that seemed important and that, that is also not reflected in here, so. Yeah, I don't think there was a consensus on includes, including prioritizing in the bill. Okay. Um, there was some discussion of it, um, but there are issues in doing that um, that have to do with local control and a whole bunch of other things. Right. Doesn't mean that it shouldn't be discussed. I think at one point we ended up um, maybe saying that that the concept of prioritization should be in the analysis. You know, should be right. a, a, addressed in the analysis, right. but not to do the prioritization in the That's bill. Right. Yes. Um, so that would be fine. Even, even that is a little bit fraught. 
uh, just so you know. Um, but that's so that's a. Uh, uh, but yes, we did have a discussion about it. One of the other things we discussed was having not having the agency of education do the analysis, but having joint fiscal do it, um, or do the do the contracting. And uh, I know Mark is here, um, and Chloe. I think Catherine is the one who was most involved in that discussion, and you know how we can sort of make that go forward. So um, the the um, uh, the other uh, issue that we never really fully discussed, but I'll throw it out, um, another very fraught issue, um, is to, if, if we decide to invest this money to do this analysis, does it make, us, make sense to put a pause on new uh, construction during the period of the analysis until we're able to act? Personally, I think it does, but I understand that that um, is not an easy discussion. Um, and that doesn't mean that you wouldn't allow, um, you know, when you've got health and safety kinds of issues, um, you need, those need to go ahead, but a new facility, uh, you know, sort of a major um, capital uh, project is maybe, it maybe needs to have a, uh, you know, Better information and um, uh, before we before we go ahead with it and a way to fund it. Um, yeah, Peter. Uh, yeah, Peter. You're muted. You're still muted. Um, there is um, authority to the secretary to go ahead if there is some sort of imminent danger, emergency authority, whatever you want to call it. And I, and I instead of uh, making this more fraught, uh, I thought the idea was to say that at least state participation was going to be on hold. Uh, schools are well, well able to go ahead on their own. Um, but it's the state participation that I thought we were referring to. No, state participation is already on hold. Oh, okay. This, this bill doesn't change it. Um, okay. Right, Becky? Yeah, there's, there's, well, there's no state participation in the form of capital dollars from the, the capital bill. There is, I suppose, state participation in the form of education spending from the, the education fund. Um, so when a, a district bonds locally, that is part of that is yeah. you know, supported by education funds. And, and to change that would be, um, may raise Brigham issues. Um, if, we, if we allow uh, local voters to uh, vote on their own grand list to do something in terms of facilities, um, there may be Brigham issues with it. I don't know, Mark, you're listening to us. Do you wanna weigh in with some thoughts on that? So on the on a moratorium. Um, well, the, the question about um, if whether whether it's possible to say that you can't use ed fund do dollars, but um, but you can go ahead and vote for construction outside the ed fund. Um, that that outside of the ed fund wouldn't work because it would be a bit Brigham violation. That's what I was thinking. I think. yeah. okay. And the other thing is, I'm just is just a thought, but I mean, in, in the current environment, I imagine a, a large school construction project would be a really hard sell at this point with voters. That's true. You may not need to do a moratorium. Yeah, good point. But, um, yeah. But yeah, that that would be a Brigham to go outside of the education fund. Um, but right now, there is nothing to stop a community from doing that if they want to go ahead and do it. Yeah. So I don't know if people have more questions um, for Becky or for Mark um, or Chloe, but I, um, I, I guess my question for people, if, you, if, if enough of this is coming back <laughs> to you, um, if you want to uh, do some work on this um, now, now, you know, we're gonna be in session um, in August, I think no matter what, maybe July, I'm not sure exactly what the summer fall schedule is. I, maybe it's not July, 
people looking at me. No, it's not July. <laughs> um, August. Um, you scared so, me. <laughs> <laughs> you were planning a trip around the world for no, July. No, I'm just planning on going to work for more than one day in a row. Um, so it, it, I don't think we need to uh, need to act on this right now. Um, but and there are other things that we need to, that are more significant that we need to act on more quickly. But I guess the question I've got for the committee is: this something you want to continue working on, whatever the time frame is? Uh, George and Scott. Um, yeah, I I do think that I want to continue working on this. And the time frame might be affected by the timing of the CARES money that we have to use. Yes. Right. And can I can I just add to that because um, this con uh, other committees have talked about CARES Act money for school construction. Um, the guidance from the Treasury suggests that you know it is it is possible that it could be used for some sort of health and safety that is a COVID related expenditure at a school. Or handling or something. Right, yeah. but the, the um, interpretation of when the expenses have to be um, incurred is that the, the project I think would have to be completed by the end of the year. So I think that adds a complication in terms of construction related projects that receive funding that it, it, it definitely creates a, a more difficult timeline. Um, Mark? I just wanna say that this, this though isn't, is, Becky, this isn't construction, right? This right. is only a study. Yeah, so it, we, whether we, we can use CARES for the study. Yeah, and so we, we did kick this around a little bit internally at JFL and we thought that probably you couldn't um, justify all of it, the entire yeah. uh, $1.5 million, dollars, but yeah. it's likely that we could identify some portion of that that would be COVID related and we could use CRF money for that. Yeah. And as long as that money goes up within the first six months of the year, and yeah. we would have to develop an RFP and send that out, then I think that would pass muster. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Scott? Yeah, I would just, I would just add on to um, what George was saying. Um, there, we have no idea what federal dollars might become available in the next 12 months and what they might be available for. Um, so I think we should definitely pursue this and be, okay. be ready for whatever comes. Good, okay. All right, um, so as I said, obviously we're not ready to vote on anything um, and um, uh, we'll work with Becky on getting a redraft that sort of moves us forward. I'm gonna put it high on the priority list, but not first, um, just because there's other things that we have to get done. Um, it, but, um, and if there are a couple people who wanna um, work uh, with me and with Becky on it, I'm happy to, I'm looking mostly at George and Scott, I think is likely culprits. Um, are you willing to do that? Okay. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll uh, work on getting another draft out there. Um, great, thank you. Um, uh, liquor, and now we're talking about liquor uh, briefly here. Uh, Damien is with us. Good morning. How are you? Nice to see you. It's good to see everybody as well. I'm I'm fine. I had a crash course in this year's liquor bill this morning, so but I'm oh, ready to talk to you. Oh, so, so I don't know the status of it. All I know is that we just got it, um, right? Yeah. So I think it passed out of House House General, um, yeah. but it does have a fee in it. So um, well, it has, a, has a bunch of things that affect fees, even though they're that you know affect permits which then affect fees so that's all i know i was asked to look at it and see whether i thought it ought to come in needed to come in the committee and i thought probably it was supposed to so it did um but bill mcgill yeah. said it was coming in here anyway so not much choice. yeah so it's uh, i think it it basically this is its last stop before it heads to the senate assuming okay. it passes the house so okay um yeah it, but good news for us is it's only eight pages so we should be able to get through it quickly <laughs> All right. Um, so um, you're going to walk it, walk through it. And do you know, um, I'm guessing that there's probably not a fiscal note on it at this point. Um, not that I'm aware of. I'm not sure that um, there would be 
a significant change to the state finances, um, but uh, you can judge for yourself whether you want a fiscal note. Well, we, um, we typically get them when we vote a bill out, um, okay. unless it's completely unrelated to anything having to do with revenue. So um, uh, that's a maybe Sorsha, you could um, get in touch with whoever it is at Joint Fiscal who would be doing it. Maybe yes, um, actually Dan Dickerson is yeah. looking at it and he's listening in on the call now, but there is Excellent. not a fiscal note right now. Good. Okay. Great. Thank so I'll, I can work with Dan um, after we get off the phone today. Uh, to answer any questions. Great. So, um, Sorsha, are you able to pull up the document? Uh, yes, give me a moment. Okay. All right, so if we can scroll down to section one. Okay, so the first section here, uh, what this uh, is addressing is, so this is the fee section um, in the, the liquor law, and it doesn't change the fees for a third class license, but what it allows is a municipality to assess an additional $50 local processing fee on these licenses. And the reason for this is typically um, most uh, establishments that have a third class license, which is a license to serve uh, spirits and other um, hard alcohol. Uh, they typically have a first class license as well, which is a license to serve beer and wine. Um, and the locality gets 50% of the first class license permit fee. So that covers their processing costs. Historically, third class only licenses went through the department, but in recent years that processing has switched to the local level, which allows for some local oversight. Um, but they haven't been getting any fees to cover their processing work. So this allows them to assess an additional $50 processing fee. Um, there are very few of these establishments that serve just hard liquor. Um, but they do exist, and so this is uh, basically addressing that issue. Um, are there any questions on this section? Just so I understand, it's to treat the standalone license in the same way that you would have if you had a first and third. Is that right? A exactly, and this is just, um, it's covering the local expense of processing yep. uh, this license for the, the few instances where this, this occurs. Um, I don't know the exact number, but my understanding is that there's very few of these third class only licenses across the state, um, but they do exist and the municipalities that process them yeah. um, have asked for the additional processing fee just to cover their costs of um, processing the permit and right. holding yeah. the uh, Pat has a question. Pat? Thank you. Uh, Damien, uh, on the... Um... A typical restaurant would be a first and third beer, That's wine, correct. liquor, correct? Yep. Yeah, so a lot of restaurants uh, may just be a first class only beer and wine. Uh, and right. then the restaurants that want to have a full bar would get a first and a third. Um, you do see a third class license only. Um, I can think of a couple places uh, in like Burlington where they serve just like craft cocktails uh, and spirits. Um, they don't serve the beer and wine. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think there is one in Burlington. Are we are we um, creating uh, another category for one or two places statewide? I, I when when I first read this, I. I kind of thought that, uh, you know, do they even exist? And then I guess there are one or two or maybe more, but um, yeah, so, yeah, go uh, ahead. I was gonna say, I, I don't think we're creating a new category because it's already occurring. Um, what we're doing is um, allowing for some of the fees uh, or for a portion of the fees to go to the municipality. Um, and it does mean that these uh, businesses here, instead of, um, paying the combined first and third fee 
they're paying uh, a third class fee. And then if the municipality elects to impose the local processing fee, the additional $50. So let me give you the comparison on the cost here. So uh, um, Damien, I think I thought I heard you say that um, that part of the fee is gonna to go to the municipality. I thought the municipal, this municipal $50, $50 is additional. I didn't the think $50 was, is like, additional. So the way it works right now is if you have a, um, here I'm pulling that up. Sorsha, can we scroll down just slightly um, to subsection B here? This might help clarify things for folks. So if you have a third class license, um, the you see here with the third class, 55% of that fee goes to the Liquor Control Enterprise Fund and 45% goes to the general fund. Um, with a first and a second class license, it's a 50-50 split between the municipality and um, the Liquor Control Enterprise Fund. Um, and so the municipality is getting, with the first class license, that is a $230 um, license. So the municipality gets $115 of that. With a third class license currently, the municipality gets nothing, but in most instances, that restaurant has a first class license. So for processing the combined application, they're getting $115. So if it's just a third class only application, the municipality would see none of the $1,095, but they still have to process the application. Yeah. This adds a local processing fee if it's just a standalone third class license. So it means for those restaurants, instead of the uh, $1,325, they're gonna pay uh, $1,145 <clears throat> for just the third class only. And 1325 is the combined first and third. Uh, Does that make sense? That? Yeah. So can I follow up on that? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I get that. And I guess it doesn't affect, uh, it affects very few um, establishments, sounds like. But anybody currently with a first and third, um, the municipality is getting a portion of that. And this, this would not add another $50 onto a first and third licensee. Nope, this is just a standalone third class license. Third. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Emily. Um, just want to fully understand the examples here. So um, if some if a distillery had a connected bar that was just selling liquor, is that a whole separate license process? Is that a fourth or something? Sorry, I don't know my liquor law very well, Damien. Yeah, so a uh, distillery can get a, a first or a third or both um, at their manufacturing facility. So they could get, uh, yeah, so we'll, let's use the example of, of um, sort of two different places. We'll take, um, uh, I'll take two places here in Montpelier. So, and I, I don't know actually if Bar Hill has a full bar, but I, I think they do. Yeah. Um, I'm not a drinker, so <laughs> I, I haven't actually been over to Bar Hill since they opened up here in Marpelier, but- There's really nice light there, not just liquor. It's like very airy, I would recommend. Yeah, my wife has <laughs> liked it, but um, yeah. Anyway, um, so let's assume that they just serve liquor um, at their, their facility there. So they would get a third class only license. They would, okay. Um, and if that's assuming they don't serve any beer and wine, and that would cost them $1,095 right now, uh, the city of Montpelier would process it, but the city of Montpelier would just pass that fee through to the uh, Department of Liquor. I understand and that part. I just wanted to know if distilleries are in a fifth category or would be included in this category. They're, they're not. Um, okay. One thing that this bill does is it um, eases the food service requirements for distilleries um, in, in that right now, in order to get that third class license, you have to have basically uh, a full kitchen. Yes. Um, and so that's been an issue for smaller distillers and wineries, particularly ones that are not in downtown Montpelier, um, but are further off the beaten path uh, and just don't see the kind of food traffic that justifies that. 
Um, but that's later in this bill and we'll get to that in a second. Can I have one more example? So if um, a caterer gets a temporary liquor license to be in a different site and is just selling liquor, is that a third class or is that a different class as well? If it's so, just a one-off. Uh, caterer has two licenses. Um, the first is their caterer's license, which is just sort of a general purpose um, license uh, where you basically say, I'm a caterer, I do events. And then for each event, they have to get a separate permit. Yes. Um, so that is a totally separate category. Great. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Uh, Damien, thank you. Thorough explanation. Um, so we're on section two. All right, let's scroll down to that. And so sections two and three are uh, related to each other. Section two, right now, all of the uh, licenses and permits and certificates issued by the department expire on April 30th, um, which is a problem for them because that means that they, they literally have thousands and thousands of licenses, permits, and certificates that need to be renewed on April 30th every year. Um, and so uh, what this basically provides is that um, instead of renewing the, all of them in one batch on April 30th, they get renewed a year after the date of issuance. So um, this does two things. It allows the department to space out its uh, staffing, and it also allows for a new business that's opening up. Say you open up uh, beginning with the holiday season, um, under the existing law, that first license you get is only good for five months. If you opened up on December 1st, now you'd have a full year on that license. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. And then section three is just a transitional provision for 2020 and 2021 that allows the department to um, any, any permit and license uh, and certificate that was renewed on April 30th would remain valid for one year or until a later renewal date designated by the department. This basically allows the department to stagger those licenses out over the coming year. Um, in order to, to space its own workload out. So that seems actually like a fairly big change in terms of workflow and cash flow. It, it's a tremendous change um, that the department has been asking for for a long time. One of the I'm concerns- I'm not opposed to it, I'm just, I'm just noting it. Not, yeah. not a lot of words for a big impact. No, it, it, it has a huge impact on the department's workflow. Um, this has and been cash a, flow as well, and, right? And cash flow, right? It's yep. going to affect the licensing um, fees, which are, I mean, it's the the taxes into the department are the the biggest chunk of their their right. cash flow. But right. um, this yeah. is going to space the cash flow out over the course of the year for renewals, yeah. uh, and that's right. thousands of licenses. Right. Uh, Bill has a question. Canfield, where is he? Yeah, Damien. There he is. Uh, this says the liquor and lottery may extend the expiration date. They're not going to cut anybody short. No, they, this doesn't let them cut anyone short. They, they have to remain for valid for at least one year or a later renewal date designated by the department. So Thank it allows you. them to extend people out uh, and give them extra time on their license. I don't know how they're planning to do that, but um, it, yeah, it, it does not allow them to say, well, you only get six months this time around. Right, thank you. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right, uh, with that, we'll move on to the first class license um, provision in section four. Um, so if you scroll down, Sorsha, just a little lower, so the underlying language is at the top of the page, I think we'll be able to see everything together. <laughs> There you go. Okay, so, um, so typically for a first class license, again, this is your beer and wine, you have to be devoted primarily to dispensing meals to the public. 
and have adequate and sanitary space and equipment for preparing and serving meals. The reason the adequate and sanitary space and equipment is underlined is just because it used to be in its own subdivision and it got bumped up with this. Um, and we used to give an exception for uh, clubs here, which are like your local VFW or American Legion, Elks, that sort of thing. We're now extending that exception on the devoted primarily to dispensing meals to the public and having adequate uh, and sanitary space and equipment for preparing and serving meals, basically a, a commercial kitchen that meets health department standards to manufacturers and rectifiers. And this will allow them to get a first or a third class license to serve full pours at their vineyard, their brewery, their distillery, um, which has been an issue. Um, so this has got a, a pretty convoluted history, but the, the basic um, issue that we're solving here is that right now they can get a fourth class license, which allows them to serve samples, but not full pours. Um, but because of some uh, ambiguity in the statute and guidance, some of the uh, manufacturers in the state were serving full pours and then were notified this past year um, that they could no longer do that um, because they were supposed to be serving the samples under their fourth class licenses. And so this allows them to get a license to serve full pours without having to take on the added expense of adding a commercial kitchen and getting all the certifications they need around that because that was cost prohibitive for a lot of our smaller manufacturers. So George has a question. Yeah, excuse me for a stupid question, but what is a rectifier? <laughs> a rectifier is, um, so there are two examples that I can give you here. Um, one would be, uh, are you familiar with uh, like a fortified wine? So, right, so you make a port uh, or any other fortified wine by taking a wine and before you finish fermenting the wine, you add in a uh, spirit, uh, typically brandy, and it kills the yeast. Um, and so that's how you get the sweet taste in your, your dessert wines. Um, but that's, a, that's rectification. It's where you're mixing one uh, liquor with another. Another example is a lot of our maple spirits uh, will take a base spirit um, that the manufacturer doesn't actually make. So they may import um, a vodka or a whiskey uh, or some other spirit, and then they add maple to give it that distinctive maple flavor and then uh, sell it to folks up here. That's another example of rectification. I, I want to note the time. It's almost noon. Yeah. Um, and. I'm okay going a little later. I haven't checked with the rest of the committee if people are. I don't wanna go much later because I've got other stuff I've gotta get done. Is it okay if we take another 10 minutes or so? Um, people all right with that? Works yeah. for me. So, yep. so let's try sorry, to move I... along though a little uh, quicker maybe in terms of uh, uh, all the great information we're getting. Um, sorry, I tend to get a little long-winded. Um, that's okay, so we need to have the information, I, so. I will speed up. So that's the bottom line here is what this allows the manufacturers to do is serve full pours without having a full commercial kitchen or restaurant operation. Um, okay. Any questions on that? Oh, wait, I gotta get my participant list up here again. Nope, we're good. Okay, in section five, we're doing the same thing with third class licenses. Um, so if you scroll down to the highlighted language there, again, we're basically adding manufacturers, whoop, too far. Uh, all right, perfect, right there. Um, we're adding manufacturers and rectifiers to the exception for clubs. Um, so you don't have to have that um, commercial kitchen. All right. I will skip on the section six here. This is festival permits. Um, what this is doing is the, this is addressing an issue in the statute where we had these festival permits um, and in, in a fashion that's very typical for our liquor laws, 
uh, there was not clarity about what a festival was. So the question had come up, particularly um, with the, the current leadership at the department has been very good at kind of identifying ambiguity in the statute and asking questions, you know, what is this meant to cover? Um, things that in the past were just kind of left ambiguous. And so the question came up with this, when we're talking about festivals, is this just, uh, for example, the Brewers Festival that happens in Burlington every year or some of the other um, Brewers Festivals around the state? Or does this include something like the Jazz Festival or the Do Good Fest? Um, and the answer was, this is meant to cover the Brewers Festival and other alcoholic beverage focused festivals. So that's what this language is doing here. It's clarifying that the primary purpose of the festival permitted under this section is the service of malt beverages, finest beverages, fortified wine, spirits. And then it's providing um, specific limits on the alcoholic beverages you can serve. If you'll scroll down to uh, put line 13 at the top of the page, Sorsha. Um, what we're basically doing is limiting it to roughly five to six standard drinks, which is, uh, it's a drink containing six tenths of a fluid ounce of alcohol. So a combined total of 3.6 fluid ounces or 84 grams of pure ethyl alcohol is the combined total here that we're going for. Um, and this is language that the department asked for in part because, um, Historically, uh, a lot of these festivals had been done on kind of an ad hoc basis, and this is designed to put everyone on standard footing that everyone is uh, um, aware of when they're going in and designing this. So, for example, at the Brewers Fest, you can now get a ticket tickets for five 12 ounce beers. Um, so, any questions on that? Didn't look like there Okay, are. great. So we'll skip on to section uh, seven. Here's section, the remainder of this section is just existing language that was moved down. Okay. So the promotional tastings for licensees, this does two things. Um, the first is it removes the requirement that the staff doing participating in the promotional tasting be off duty for the rest of the day. Um, the reason that this is being removed is, is two reasons. One, practicality. Um, oftentimes, it's very hard to get staff who are on their day off to come in for a promotional tasting. Um, and two, the amounts are so small that the concerns about uh, staff becoming intoxicated are, are fairly negligible. Um, so the department has agreed um, this is something that was requested by folks in the restaurant and the beverage industry, and the departments agreed that it's okay um, here. And then the second change here is, uh, if we scroll down there, it used to require two days written notice to the Division of Liquor Control. Um, that's being taken out because oftentimes these are, are ad hoc, um, and it's hard to get two days written notice into the department. So this is easing that requirement again, because the amounts being served are so small. Um, the concerns about the department doing a drop-in sort of audit or inspection during one of these tastings are, this is not something that, um, my understanding is this is not something where they feel they need that two days prior notice, like they might for a public tasting event or something like that where beverages are being served in larger quantities to members of the public who might then be getting in their car or where there might be underage patrons and that sort of thing. Any questions on that? Uh, no, don't see any. Okay, the last section here, section eight, this is revising uh, a sunset provision um, to give the department and the manufacturers an additional year to try to work out a compromise on this issue. And basically the issue that came up uh, was around, um, again, ambiguity in the statute um, that uh, had resulted in the department permitting um, a couple of 
uh, manufacturers to get uh, a license to operate a, a first or a third class license establishment away from their manufacturing premises. Um, and this came back to the legislature last year. The legislature clarified that the intent was that manufacturers only get licenses for their manufacturing facility to operate that sort of establishment. Um, but then grandfathering in um, the, uh, the off-premises locations that were currently there. And some of these off-premises locations were also using special events permits, which are a short four-day duration permit, allowing, um, allowing them to serve beverages. But the way that was worded allowed you to just uh, get, I think, something like 90 of these permits for the year uh, for the same location and basically operate a, a first or a third class location without actually getting the license. So uh, this is basically extending the, the effective date for those two sections and grandfathering in um, the current manufacturers that have been taking advantage of that. Questions? Hey. No, doesn't look like there are any. Uh, All right. A quick question. I, I, I know somebody is working on a fiscal note, but I think, uh, Sorsha, can you remind me? Uh, Dan is doing it, but what the status is? Yes, it's Dan and he's on. Um, he doesn't have a fiscal note right now, but he'll be working on it. It is not. Dan, can okay. you weigh in? I'm sorry? I'm just Dan? seeing if Dan can weigh in. I see he's still on the call. Yeah, he's here. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I, when this bill was being worked on in uh, House General, it didn't have a bill number and there were a few different provisions that are no longer there. Um, so I'd, I'd weighed in on the things that aren't there anymore and, and I haven't seen the things that are there. Um, so my hope is, um, you know, I can get a few hours this afternoon to work on it and maybe tomorrow morning I'll have something ready. That's fine. If, if something were ready, I was thinking we might be ready to vote, but, um, but we will wait um, and do that on Tuesday, which is when we meet again. Um, okay. I, uh, the question I've got for the committee, it doesn't seem as though we have any changes in the bill. My uh, sense is that uh, we're probably most likely to vote it out as is. Am I incorrect about that? Has somebody got something that they wanna throw on the table? Didn't look like it. So we need the fiscal note before we send it out there. Uh, question for the committee, do you want the fiscal note before we vote? Or before we report it? Anyone care? Somebody want to make the motion, George? Yeah, I would say that it appears that there's very little that's going to impact the revenues of the state. And I don't, I don't personally think that we need to wait for the fiscal note. I'm, I'm happy to entertain a motion to uh, vote the bill out. We won't report it until we have a fiscal note. Um, so it wouldn't go so on. So moved. Yeah, okay. Second. Um, um, moved and seconded to uh, vote. Um, I don't remember the bill number. That was my question. Do we have a bill number for me to put in the roll call? No, I just, this is just a bill. Sorry. H956. Thank you. 956. Um, so, um, so it's been moved and seconded that we vote H956 out favorably. Um, is there discussion? No. Is that, was that Peter who seconded it? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Ready to call the roll? I am now. Okay. Okay. Um, Representative Anthony. Yes. Representative Beck. Yes. Representative Brennan. Yes. Representative Donovan. Has left. She had to leave. Yeah. Okay. Representative Kornheiser. Yes. Representative Maslin. Yep. Representative Shy is yes. Representative Till? Yes. Representative Young? Yes. Representative Canfield? Yes. Representative Ansel? Yes. 10-0-1. Good. 
Um, so uh, first of all, I wanna thank um, Damien for uh, getting through this uh, quickly and um, and with not a lot of <laughs> not a lot of notice ahead of time. Um, so You're welcome. I appreciate it. Um, and Dan, we will wait for the fiscal note, and I'll check with the speaker about whether she wants it to go in tomorrow's calendar. That would mean it would be on notice tomorrow and out for action Tuesday, which I think would probably be fine. Um, but I'll just check with her and. Um, Damien, it's, uh, it, it's, we don't need to do anything, even though this looks, doesn't have a bill number on it. This is what the bill H956 says, right? The thing that- Yeah, we, so that yeah. it's, okay. yeah, H956 was, um, yeah, it's as introduced by general. And right. so I think you're just, um, okay. yeah, you're, you're reporting it without any changes. Good. And Dan, you'll um, uh, send to Sorsha so she can distribute to the committee the fiscal notice and as it's done? Yes, I will. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. Uh, anything else anyone has on the committee? That was a lot of good work. Um, can I ask who no? will be reporting this bill, if you know? Um, I, I, let me, I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great. Thanks, everybody. See you soon, I guess. See ya. Bye. Janet? Yeah? I think the live stream now. Thank you. Janet? Yes, Bill. The governor is going to make an announcement tomorrow about beauty salons and barbershops. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be squeezed on Tuesday between this. So if I could be ahead of schedule, knowing what our times are, it would be great. Um, I, it's the same time that, that we had this week. Now, this morning we were supposed to start at 10, but I got pulled to another meeting. Um, mm -hmm. So we started at 11. But the times I have um, scheduled are the Tuesday, I think it's Tuesday at 10. So yeah. she can help me not, uh, Wednesday at 9 30. Is that right? Or 9, 9, 9 to 10 30. And then Thursday at 10. I've asked. Um, to see if we need more time to see if I can get another hour in there. Um, sure. But I haven't figured out when that would happen. Mm -hmm. But what I'm hoping to do is to, um, we've got two uh, charter things or local option taxes. And then um, uh, I wanna get the ed finance thing moved. Although I think with the work that we did yesterday, we're getting closer on that. So, and, and we're starting to get occasional bills. Thank you.